if you want to control the way the eye sees and where the eye goes with multiple focus points in digital, because you have more resolution that the lens resolves, that the file shows you exactly what the lens sees and you can print in a greater resolution, what happens is this. If I take a picture and I want a shallow depth of field, and this is the area that I want to be the point of focus, see what happens? Okay, I'm at f5.6 here. The problem with that is that all of this is out of focus. Now physics says that the only thing that can be in focus is that which the lens is physically focused upon and anything that crosses the plane of focus. And you're going to let me show you this as an example. So if I want to have multiple objects in focus, what I need to have then is this is my front point. This is my midpoint. You see how this changes. This is my side point. See how this changes. And this is my back point. And what I need to do is I need to be able to then combine my midpoint, my side point. And you see that since these are both on the same plane, they're in focus, and my back point. So that what I can get is the quality of bokeh that I want. I want this level of blur, the shallow depth of field in my image, and I want to have all of these elements in focus. So to be able to do that, what I need to be able to then do is have four individual images. One of the reasons why I like using focal point is that I can introduce even more blur selectively once I've created the image that I want, that it gives me a more realistic blur based on the way in which I can change angle. Now let's take a look, if we can skip for a second, let's take a look at the concept of what a fractal is and why fractal scaling is important, particularly now with larger megapixel cameras. Now there are two types of geometry that we, we work with. There is Euclidean geometry, which is a geometry of smoothness, and then there is fractal geometry, the geometry of roughness, the geometry of nature. For the longest time we believed that nature was just absolutely random and there was no geometric order. And that's not true. Nature is based on the concept of self-similarity, and what self-similarity is is this. If we take a look at this diagram of triangles, what we can see if we look at this is that, and let's just isolate out an area, is this area here that if I zoom in and zoom in and continue to zoom in, that you can see that these are constantly made up of the same repeating self-similar patterns. Now the way that fractal scaling works is it converts your image into a fractal, a series of self-similar objects, and then iterates or repeats those self-similar objects into an image. Now, according to Michael Barnsley, the, the man who invented this particular approach to fractal scaling, um, or to Im using fractals in image, is that a fractal is the border, the edge, between order and chaos. And what chaos is, is it's random order, and what order is, is it's frozen chaos. That's how he describes it. The point being is that it is the absolute edge by definition. And if you're making big prints, what you need to do is maintain edge definition. So if you're making any print whatsoever, just because I have a 24.5 megapixel camera and I have a lot of file size, what that means is I have a lot of image information. It doesn't necessarily mean that I can make this 24 megapixel file into a 1.62 gigabyte file. What we have at our disposal, what we have as our tools, is bicubic interpolation. And what I want to do is I want to show you in bicubic interpolation in comparison to fractal scaling. And what we have here is we have a 5 megapixel camera capture that is blown up, f I think, 400%, 500%. Now, if I zoom into this area right here, this is the area I want to look at. Let's zoom right in to just that square area here. Let's go to the first 
of our processes, which is the 10% 10-step process that you use by cubic interpolation in 10% increments to scale upwards. This actually is uh, derived from um, sharpening in the Quantel paint box, that that's how we used to sharpen when that was the state of the art, that you would do it in 10% increments. So if it worked there, it has to work here. What I want you to pay attention to is this area right here. Do you see how if I zoom in here, the artifacting that I have going on here, this is not really, really very pretty to look at. All of this stuff that's going on here and the haloing and the blurriness of the image, the artifacting of bicubic interpolation upwards is to blur and the artifacting of bicubic interpolation downwards is to aggravate edge problems. So basically bicubic interpolation is as evil up as it is down. Now if you're doing even numbers, 200, 400, 800, there's really no foul, you're just pixel doubling. Where artifact, artifacting comes into play is when you are doing a 513 percent scale or a 492 percent scale. These numbers, that's where our problems are because they're not even doubles. Now this is looking at using what Adobe recommends, and let's zoom in again a little bit tighter, which is bicubic smoother. Now Adobe recommends, and I want to zoom in here, that you use bicubic smoother up and bicubic sharper down. And if you take a look at this difference, there is some serious blur going on in bicubic smoother. Now this is using bicubic sharper up which Adobe recommends for downscaling. And as you can see here, bicubic sharper actually does appear to do a better job than bicubic smoother. And bicubic sharper does a better job with regards to lack of artifact than the 10% upraising. So far of the three, bicubic 10% stepping is probably the worst. Now, if we take a look at genuine fractals, what you can see is that all of the edges are maintained and the artifacting is minimized. So let's take a look at bicubic 10% and genuine fractals. As you can see, this does a better job. Now, I make a lot of big prints and right now I'm working with a D3X and 100% of my images from the day I started using genuine fractals to today, 100% of my images are all stored as fractals and scaled as fractals. And the reason that I do that is because I need to have every possible edge that I can get to make the best possible print. And I believe that fractal scaling affords me the best way to make a small file a big file, to take a 75 megabyte file and make it a 650 meg file, or take a 75 meg file and make it a 1.62 gigabyte file. That this is the only way. And when you download the um, PDF, this actual file that I'm showing you in full resolution is there for you to take a look at. And what you can do if you want is you can do this experiment yourself. So as you can see, I wouldn't recommend this one. These do in a pinch. I find, believe it or not, that if I go by cubic sharper, I actually get a little bit better image than by cubic smoother, which I know I'm going to hear a lot of grief about. And then, which neither one of these ways I use, and so that I know I won't get any grief, this is the way that I scale all of my images, period. And this is the way that I recommend doing it, and you have this to look at. So. Let's zoom. A question for you. Sure. Shoot. There's a, there was a really good question that Laurie just asked, and I, I actually I would like to interrupt it since you're talking about kind of enlargement. What about reduction? Would you use perfect resize or genuine fractals for image reduction? Hold on one second. Oh, I just need to clarify something here, so that you understand the grain of salt with what it is that I'm speaking. I, I was employee number six of the company that invented the technology called Genuine Fractals. And though I do think that Genuine Fractals is a silly name and voiced that opinion when we came up with it, if I don't say perfect resize, please forgive me because this is my baby, this software. So yes, Genuine Fractals for downscaling would be as good as for upscaling 
but the reason to consider is something called dot gain. If you're going to make a picture smaller and print it on smaller paper, you're not going to see the artifacting issues at the level you will see them when you go bigger because of something called dot gain, that the dots are closer together, which gets back into a discussion we're having about resolution, which, um, for example, a wide angle lens and a telephoto lens. Wide angle lenses have a greater depth of field, right? No. All lenses have the same depth of field. What is the what it is is angle of view. The smaller the object, the more in focus it appears because the edges are all closer together. So the same thing here. The image will appear tighter and the artifact won't be noticeable because all the, everything is smaller and closer together. So where you'll see these artifacting issues are on big prints because they're big. Would I downscale? Yes, I use genuine fractals to downscale and I use genuine fractals to upscale. The first thing that I will do though, before I go to fractals, in all honesty, is call something called remapping the bitmap. There are, and what that is, is I will go to image, image size, okay, and let's say I want to make the picture bigger then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to 280. Do you see how all of a sudden now this made the width and height bigger than if I went to 300? The magic numbers for an Epson printer, I can't speak for any other printer because all I do is use Epson, um, for this generation of printers is 280, um, 280 and um, 360, and what it is is it's multiples of 90. That the way the printer head is broken out, it, it used to be 240, and now with the way the new printer head is, my understanding is that it's 280 DPI. Um, gives you the best print. 360 is optimum for the printer head. If you're printing on um, matte papers, sometimes going to a slightly lower resolution 240 or 280 is a better way to go because of something called dot gain. If you need to make a picture bigger and it's a small bump, just simply remap the bitmap, which is change the resolution um, from 300 to 280 or 300 to 240 will get you a better looking picture. But or 360, 300 though is not optimum for an Epson printer. 360 is the optimum, most optimum print comes from a 360 file. So what you can see here is just that, that I can remap this. If I go to 240, let's go to 240, you see how now I have a 35 inch image. So long as I'm between 180 and 360, life is good. The closer to 360, the better. And what I would do is I print at 360 for all of my premium luster, um, exhibition fine art, and cold pressed natural prints, because I print on cold pressed natural paper, because that paper can hold that dot. On my velvet fine art prints, I tend to print at 280 or 240, and the reason being is that it gives me a little less dot gain problems. Now, just a simple thing to do is that, but when I use GF, excuse me, perfect resize, um, will come here, and when the dialog box comes up, What I'll do is in the dial, let me get out of it, let's get into a smaller file. When the dialog box comes up, I just type in 360 and then the critical width of the printer. That's what's most important, is that I go to the critical width of the printer. And that's how I, I determine my images. And let's just pull any one of these up. Boom. So if I go here and then go to image, automate. No, that, that's a Golden Gate Bridge. Excuse me, Manhattan Bridge. I'm a San Franciscan. Thank you very much. All right. So what I will do here is in this num this box right here, I will type in 360. And then let's say I'm working on a 9900, which is my big printer. The critical width on that would be 44. And then I would type that in. And then I would hit apply. And then it would scale the image accordingly. And the way that I work in my workflow is if I have a, a, a TIFF that just says TIFF, that tells me 
that it is a file from my raw processor. My PSB, which is different from PSD, PSB is the large document file format. That tells me that that's a working file with all my layers. Then when I save it, I will save it um, the file as a .stn and I will save it lossless. What that tells me is that that's a scaling file. And then when I repurpose the image, let's say I make a 13 by 19, then I will save it visually lossless, which is a wavelet file, and that will be, let's say it's 13 by 19, so this would be v, v01002 underscore 13 by 19 vl dot stn, and the file size tells me that it is a file that has been repurposed to that size. If I do printer specific corrections, I will make it a PSD, a Photoshop document, and what it will be is it will have those that size and say PSD, that tells me that there are image specific adjustment layers for printing that specific file on a specific device, be it my 4900, my 9900, 3880, or the 3000, which are the printers that I have in my studio currently. So that's what my workflow is, is that it's all geared towards image specificity and that the way in which I store my images and the way in which I print my images is from a fractally scaled image. One of the advantages of working with Genuine Fractus Perfect Resize is that I can carry my entire image archive with me on a hard drive. And since I do a lot of traveling, it's really nice to be able to have somebody wanting to buy or a print for something or an image for something and to have the ability to send them the file for publication or for image usage, and I carry that on a 500 uh, gigabyte hard drive. That's like everything I have ever done as a piece of art sits on a 500 gigabyte hard drive as a fractal with room to spare. And to put into perspective how much I shoot, I have seven and a half terabytes worth of files I have to look at from last year, which is why I'm sort of on a shooting moratorium right at the moment until I get through that those files. I, was, I went a little crazy last year shooting. So that's that's the workflow through fractals. And, oh, you have a question? Okay. Yeah, actually, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Candace has a really good question, and this is a very fair question to ask. You know, you admittedly are uh, an Epson uh, printer user. You love Epson. What about in terms of uh, the principles that you were talking about with critical width um, and ideal resolutions? Does would you say that holds true for other manufacturer printers like Canon? Um, Canon, I, I think it's 240. Don't hold me to that. But the ultimate resolution tends to be 360. Um, the, um, my understanding of why it, it's 300 comes from pre-press. That back in the pre-press days, 300 was the magic number. And that's why we are stuck with that number, is because that's just the way it's been. Um, it's one of those things where we haven't quite caught caught up with what the current reality is. For example, go into a frame store and buy a 13 by 19 frame. You can buy an 11 by 14 frame, you can buy a 16 by 20 frame, but you can't buy a 13 by 19 frame or a 17 by 22 frame, even though those are the paper sizes that the devices that make the outputs make because they're not photographic sizes. Or my favorite silly thing was when I was at a art store looking for a portfolio, I print uh, images that are 24 by 30. I can buy a portfolio that's 23 by 31, so that means that I could fill the portfolio by volume. And we haven't quite figured out that these numbers, though used to work, are not necessarily the numbers that are now current. So that's why 300 exists. Um, but my best guess, and please know that that's what it is, is that yes, 360 is the magic number, but I still think what is true for HP and Canon is 240 as the other bingo number, but I would check that with somebody that is more expert with those printers than I. Is that a fair enough answer? That's that's excellent. Um, the, another pr question came in, I was kind of waiting for this question to come in, it, it, it's one that um, Joni asked, and it, it's Whenever we start talking about printing in any capacity, one of the questions that always comes in is, you know, in your case, if you can give me your thoughts on sending to a professional lab, what considerations would you take there? Because you, right now, and we talked about this yesterday, you are in full control of your prints, you know. Yeah, I'm a control freak when it comes to printing. Um, Ansel Adams said, 
Um, the greatest photographers in the world are always the greatest printers, but the greatest printers are not necessarily the greatest photographers. It's understanding the printing process that is actually the most key element in realizing your voice. In the conversation we had last night over, over dinner, your first introduction to real sushi, um, is that when you're taking a picture, the more you know about the middle, the more informed your decisions can be at the beginning because you're in service of the end, which is the print. So everything that you do at moment of capture is in service of the print. Every decision, every choice, everything that you're doing technically is about that. But we never have the conversation of what the print is in service of. And the print is in service of your voice. So we're back to the beginning. You're constantly tra traveling the circle, but it's in a straight line. So understanding the printing process is key to realizing your vision and voice in a manner in which people can look at and be moved like you were when the picture took you. There's a big difference in conceptualization, I think, that's important. This is an Ernst Haas concept, and um, I, I live by this one. It's like stop taking pictures. Be taken by your pictures. Let the picture pull you through the lens. That's what is key for having your voice realized. It's not about going out and looking for the picture. It's going out and letting the picture take you. Now, with regards to the printing process, what would I send a lab? I would send a lab, um, if you can get it, the profile for the device that it's going to be outputted to so that you can make considerations for it. What I would do is get a much better understanding of sharpening than most people have. Um, sharpening is like this statement. Have you ever heard somebody that said that they were a poor judge of character? Okay, All right. You know, everybody says, oh, I'm a good judge of character, right? And the problem is, if you were such a good judge of character, and this is me more than I care to admit, then you wouldn't be taken advantage of, ripped off, all right? We think we know more about sharpening than we actually do. Like, for example, the reason why you always hear sharpen last before output, don't you only sharpen once, which is for output, comes from service bureaus taking a file that is over sharpened and then having to print it and then the person that went to the service bureau saying this is crap this looks like so the service bureau says no 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 don't worry about it I'll do the sharpening for you think about this these this is business time is money so it must be worth more for the business person that's running an output service to take the time to sharpen your picture then to allow you to sharpen the picture and then have to eat what it, what the costs are for materials and to go through the, the headache. You can sharpen an image more than once. I mean, I'll take you through it. Right, A raw file. When you open up a raw file, that raw file is sharpened. It has to be due to the nature of the way in which the file is interpolated. So we already have one sharpening. Okay. Then you can do aesthetic sharpening which is tweaking the image so that you control the eye. Now we're twice. Now we're sharpening for output. Now sharpening is not necessarily the last thing you do. Let's say you have an image that has a high degree of blur to the point where the background is beginning to moray, which is you're getting that topographical map look because computers do not like random. They want linear, so they try to linearize everything. So if there's too much blur in an image, you are going to get that stepping process. Well, how do you break that down? You introduce monochromatic Gaussian noise. Do you want to sharpen the noise? No. So sharpening is not necessarily the last step. Now, what I do as my absolute last step after everything is done is I run something called midtone contrast or midtone contouring. Um, I delineate it differently. Uh, Matt Colbert calls it midtone contrast. It's the basis of the clarity tool in Photoshop. The reason why it's called midtone contouring in my action is that if you're using Max Action, I set mine up a little bit differently, which my presets at 30. He recommends that it's between 20 and 40 percent. I set it at 30. Mine comes with a layer mask, and so there's a, enough difference so that you have the delineation. Now I run this 100 percent of the time before I print, and I do this to size. And what that does is it gets back to the point we're talking about with fractal scaling. It holds the edges. It tightens the edges up. So by tightening the edge up by using a very large radius high-pass filter in the mid-tone 
area of the file, what I'm capable of doing is holding the edges, which means that I get a crisper, sharper looking print at a larger size. And this is something that I do 100% of the time. Now, what the goal is when you're working on an image is to minimize artifacting. All artifacting is cumulative and may be multiplicative. So I have to live in the world of 2%, which means that if it gives me a 2% quality increase, I will do it. And the reason being is this. Let's say I, I, I run contrast on a layer. Okay, and contrast is the increase, is the ratio between light and dark. So I increase the contrast of an image. That gives me about a 2% quality decrease. Okay, because the thing to keep in mind is that no matter what you do to a file, you're always clipping data. And if you clip data, you're introducing artifact. And if you introduce enough artifact, it will come back and bite you. And in actuality, the raw file, when you open it up, that kind of magenta yellow cast, very flat looking file that opens up is the cleanest the data will ever be. That's the cleanest data state. So I've run contrast. Now I'm going to run sharpness onto the layer I've run contrast. So I now have a 2% quality decrease and my sharpness gives me a 3% quality decrease. So 3 plus 2 is 5 times 3, which means that I'm going to have a 15% quality decrease. Will I see that? You're darn tootin'. What's the workaround around that? Simple. You run one layer with contrast, you run another layer with sharpness, and then you use layer opacity and layer masks to blend the two together, and what you wind up with is about a 2.5%, 3% quality decrease. That you're not, you're going to negate the multiplicative aspect and just be stuck with the cumulative aspect. and that small percentage is not something you're going to see. So the things that you do at the beginning of an image that's only 2% quality decrease, if you're not paying attention to it, can echo its way all the way up towards the end so that you have a considerable drop in quality, which is why I do the things that I do and why I pay attention to the workflow that I do, that I do mid-tone contouring at the end, that I build my images up a certain way, that I go out of my way to maintain edge integrity because that with my printing devices since I use inkjet which is a spray spraying type print uh, way to get a, a print I want to hold that I want to minimize dot gain I want to make sure that all my edges are tight and that I get the best possible print and it's the quality of the file I send the printer that determines the quality of my print <clears throat> to that point, a question came in a little bit ago that I think is a good segue. Um, if we're going to talk about quality of prints, um, let's talk about uh, file formats. So the, the Michael asked a question. He says, you know, at some point I convert to the, the, highest, re the highest resolution JPEG to send to a Pro Lab. Um, am I losing out by not keeping the perfect resize file in TIFF? Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, let me see if this is the cur what I got. Is that I, when I send to a lab, I send it out as the highest quality JPEG that I can. Am I losing something by not keeping the perfect resize file, the .stn file, or a TIFF? And I'll, uh, not forget the STN file, just a TIFF file. Just Use, a TIFF but, file. but enlarging using perfect resize and saving it as a TIFF. Okay. Um, I would send it to the lab as a TIFF. Okay, the TIFF is the most stable of all the file formats, and it is the one in which will not um, artifact. With JPEG, JPEG is a very old file format, and it's an 8-bit file format. And what that means is that it stores data in 8-bit blocks. So what you're going to pick up is something called microblocksylation, those little squares that you see, because the frequency hits... 8 bits and wherever it is it ends and so you get these little blocks of information whereas a TIFF doesn't do that. So uh, JPEG is something that I, I reserve for sending pictures to people on the internet or sending pictures um, up to my website. That's what that's good for. But if you want the best possible print, I, I don't know of any lab that can't, won't take a TIFF. Um, now the trick is layered TIFFs versus not layered TIFFs. There are some some software that still may not read a layered TIFF, so I would send a flattened TIFF. If I was going to do midtone contouring and I'm going to send it off 
to somebody to print, what I will do is have it print because you have when you do midtone contouring, you do that to size. It's a it's a form of sharpening, so it has to be done to size. Um, is I would get the size that I want or find out what the service bureau, what I'm printing, if it's going to be a 44 by 36, I'd ship it off, if it's an 8 by 10, whatever that is, do all of that, save it as a TIFF, give myself a notation that tells me that's what it is, and that's what I would do. But I would recommend using TIFF over JPEG if I, if I can do that. What about DNG files? Um, this is, you're setting me up. Um, I, I personally do not uh, use DNG files, and I don't really see the need to use DNG files. Um, I shoot in RAW. Unless your camera uses DNG as its RAW file format, which there are some that do, then that becomes the file format that you use. For example, I would never think to convert a .NEF file, a Nikon RAW file, into a DNG. There's no purpose for that. It's I'm going to double my file size and create a file format in which doesn't give me all the information that is in my file, and um, I already have a non-destructive file format from a company that is most likely never going to go away. Nikon's an almost 100-year-old company whose design philosophy is simply this. The lens you bought in 1962 works on the camera you buy today. Um, the argument that how do you know your camera company is going to be here tomorrow, or how do you know they're going to support your camera, the, the lookup table, the LUT for a RAW file is so tiny it makes no sense not to include it. So uh, I don't use DNG personally. Um, the relevance for DNG is, let's say there are 25 people in a company shooting 25 different cameras, and we need to be able to have one file format in which everybody can use that does retouching. Okay, then DNG would make sense. But as an archiving file format, um, the day that my camera company goes belly up would be the day then that I would batch process all my files into DNG. But other than that, I, I don't use DNG because I already have a non-destructive file format called NEF. Does that answer your question? Okay. Did I get myself in trouble? Okay. It's not that um, you got any trouble. It's it's, and I agree with what uh, Andre was saying that that there, are, you will find that a lot of Lightroom gurus, and and I'm totally guilty of it too, of kind of preaching that converting to DNG is the way to go. Well, to what we were talking about by being able to to to. Uh, Put a wrapper around the, the sidecar file. But whoever shares a raw file, that so for what it's worth, uh, you know, attendees, uh, the conversation actually with Vincent yesterday convinced me to switch back to CR2. So uh, going forward, well, I would never give my raw file to somebody. Right. Okay. Exactly. You know, it's like here, here's my negatives. Please feel free to do whatever you want because at that point, you know, I, I just that's not something I would do. Um, what I do give away, if I give away a file, is a file that has all of my copyright information in it. Photoshop has a, a system of being able to embed copyright information so that no matter how small the, the sample, you can find out who's using it. And that's a service you buy. Um, yeah, Digimark. And I, I would do that. I, I'm not going to give away my raw file. That's just that's giving away your negative. What about then saving as a candidate? Just ask. What about saving um, in, in terms of archiving PSD versus TIFF? Um, PSB, large. Um, let me show you. Let's go to save as. What I do here is you see where it says large document format, and that changes to PSB. PSB can handle files above 2 gigs. Now, if you're working with high megapixel cameras, a 24.5 megapixel camera, which in 16-bit Pro Photo, which is the color space I recommend you work in, and the bit depth I recommend that you work in if you're doing image manipulation, you have 149 point something, let's call it 150 megabyte file you just opened. So I duplicate the layer. And I make it a smart filter, and then I apply a plugin. So I'm going to do something to. 
Okay, so I'm going to increase contrast using a plugin. So now I have 150 megabytes plus 150 megabytes plus whatever the smart filter is plus whatever the plugin attached to that. So now I'm at a 325 megabytes. Okay, well then I run another plugin. Now I'm at 450. I'm going to do six or seven other manipulations to the image. All of a sudden now I'm into the two gig range and I haven't even made the thing big. So what I do in my workflow is I can tell what file or what state the data is in based on which file format I use. Okay, straight TIFF with no delineation after it, like DSC underscore 0025, tells me that that is a TIFF file that has been converted from a raw file. It is the base file, it's the intermediary file from my raw processor. I use Capture NX, I open up my raw files, save it, and then move to Photoshop. Because frequently I do a lot more into my file than a raw processor can handle. Um, so what I now know in my folder, and what I do in the folder of the image I'm working on is the raw file will be in there, the original raw file. If I do edits to the raw file, it will be the number with CC. So I have the corrected raw file, the uncorrected raw file, the TIFF that is rendered from that raw file as the intermediary work file, all in the same folder. Whatever it is that I'm working on, if I'm going to be working in 16-bit, the file will be DSC underscore 0025 underscore 16 bit dot PSB right here. That tells me it's a 16 bit file that I am working on. If for whatever reason, let's say I'm using render lighting effects or whatever 8 bit filter that I have to use, if I do that, then I will have DSC underscore 0025 underscore 8 bit dot PSB. Again, tells me that these are working files. One of the habits that I'm now in when it comes to working with high megapixel files is I break things down. For example, let's say I have an out of focus photograph and I'm using a technique that I have for bringing it back, which is called the Lazarus effect. What I'll do is that will be the sharpening file. My lab coloring file will be a different PSB, all of which are these separate files that are individual so that I'm not trying to move three and four gigs worth of files in Photoshop. I'm just trying to work on the small area that I have and I have a non-destructive workflow that I have all the things that I need, all the elements that I need in the same folder that I can find that I have a pathway all the way back to the original source data. The PSD, the Photoshop document, this one here, okay, PSD, that would be, let's say this is a done file, and what I would see is okay, and what that will tell me is that if it's a PSB, this is a file that's 24 by 30, and that I've done something that is specific to a printer. I might put down what printer it is, let's say it's the 9900. Um, VFA, so that tells me 9900 Velvet Fine Art, that I've done something specific to that and that certain things, layers, adjustment layers, specific to that is there. If I see this, okay, that tells me that this is a file that everything is good to go, ready to print, flattened, we're done, and it's a TIFF. Why do I use TIFF? It's the most stable file format across multiple software platforms. If I see this, what that tells me is that this is all of this information visually lossless, which means that it is a fractal file saved in the wavelet aspect of genuine fractals specific to this size. If what I see is that, that tells me it's a scaling file. That means that this is the file in which I scale up from, that I repurpose from, okay? And I save all of my files, when I'm all done, a copy of them like this, so that I have that. And this 
is what will travel with me on my hard drive is that I will have all of these scaling capable files so that should I have somebody need something should somebody want to use something in an article or whatever and believe me it happens enough to warrant this my entire imaging archive of final art is stored in this format that always travels with me no matter where I am in the world so I'm not stuck to my studio and my naming convention in the way that I work when I work in the field is let's say I'm going to Burma so the folder will be Burma November 2010 that tells me I was in Burma November 2010 the first folder will be the name of the area that I'm in and the date that I shot it in I will then set the camera to start going numerically so it'll be VV010203 so the further on I am numerically that tells me how further on in the journey I am so the, you know day four day five day six each folder will have its own individual name so that I can if I need to go to the raw file call up my assistant and say pull this up do this make me a PDF of the contact sheet send it to me so that I use the operating system to tell me what's going on that the folders tell me where what things are that I can tell where I am numerically in the um, shoot sometimes I may uh, use a naming convention that the Navy use which is the VRN which tells me the date the time the location in the file format um, when I have finished files then I give the name of the image file in a folder format and that's stored on my server in a server that's nothing but um, layered files the PSB PSD files when I travel there'll be nothing but STN files in folders that describe what these images are and where they're from so that I can quickly find them just by memory and the reason why I can do that and appear like I have a photographic memory is I'm just using the operating system the way it works I just have to remember how the operating system works not necessarily the name but it, it appears that I'm much smarter than I am awesome well I think with that um, I don't see any other questions that came through oh here's a quick question actually and uh, I'm not sure there was a one of, one of our attendees was asking whether you can speak to the resolution of the Epson 2880 whether it's the same as the 3000 yeah yeah, yeah. okay cool uh, the 2880 the 3000 is just the 2880 but on like some steroids <laughs> High capacity inks, big uh, wireless printing. Um, it's a nice printer, and um, it really, really is. So that's the, that's the printer that I use in the um, upstairs studio to do all my proofing and stuff when I'm working upstairs in my house versus downstairs in my my big studio. Got it. Um, I'm just trying to see here. Looks like we want more, more Vincent's Power Hour. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny V's Power Hour. <laughs> um, that's what we actually titled today's webinar. Um, all right, I'm going to take over now so that we can conclude the webinar. Um, actually, uh, Candace asked about the Welcome to Oz. 2.0 if you can talk about that the availability and what's going on there uh, uh, well because I'm hearing the echo welcome to Oz oh. my new book welcome to Oz 2.0 well funny you should ask that question welcome to two, Oz 2.0 is a 100 percent complete from the ground rewrite not a revision but a rewrite of my first book and what I did in welcome to Oz 2.0 is um, looked at the images and said all right with what it is that I know today based on where technology is today and software what would I do with these images as if I did them for the very first time so that we now have something to compare to you have welcome to Oz 1.0 welcome to Oz 2.0 and you can see the growth and the change in the use of technology the book is a hundred pages bigger than the um, last book and um, it can comes with two hundred and fifty dollars worth of free software including focal point 2.0 and the uh, 
free chapter that I gave you, which is the overview of the book and also my practices, what I do. Right now what I'm working on is from Oz to Kansas 2.0, which I think is going to wind up being Oz to Kansas 3.0, which is almost every black and white conversion technique known to man. And that book is a programmed learning approach, which is the same as Welcome to Oz. What I did in Welcome to Oz 2.0 is I took four images from soup to nuts, beginning to end. I had one person that commented as a, a critique that he wished that I had many, many more smaller examples instead of working on this one image a bunch. And I appreciate that sentiment, but I do disagree with regards to what it is that I was trying to show. What I'm trying to show is a workflow with image and a way of thinking, that it's a programmed learning approach. And what that means is that when you're done, you sh I hope, my hope is that you have the echo of knowledge that will inform decisions. That if you can do these four lessons, you pretty much can do almost everything that I do on an image. That that's the goal. My goal is to teach you how to fish. With the black and white book, which was a chapter in my first book, there is so much that I wanted to talk about that it um, wound up the first pass being 192 pages for a chapter. And that's a bit much considering that the first chapter is 116 pages. Um, publisher and I agreed that perhaps maybe this is its own standalone book. So what I've done in that book, which is going to be out, um, you know, God willing, the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, is look at every black and white conversion technique and discuss why they work, why they don't work, when to use them, when not to use them, and to start looking at the theory of seeing and the theory of creating using black and white conversion as the metaphor to discuss that. The two questions I frequently get asked about my black and white work is, did you see that image in black and white, and how do I learn how to see in black and white? And this all comes from this idea, comes from the, when I was a kid, 13 years old, um, Boris Spatsky and uh, Bobby Fischer played chess in Iceland, and everybody in my neighborhood was into chess, and I was the guy that everybody liked to play because they could absolutely humiliate. You know, it was just brutal. I mean, you could beat me in three moves and all that sort of stuff, and my father took pity on me because he used to beat the snot out of me playing chess. and So he bought me Bobby Fischer's book instead of How to Checkmate Your Dad in Chess, that book. Um, and what I did was I read all 275 pages of it, or the, the different exercises, and I went from being the kid that you could knock the snot out of on the chessboard to nobody wanting to play me because what I had was I had that echo of knowledge, and the program learning approach always made sense to me. So what I have been working on in both books, and I think I've really found my stride in the book I'm working on now, is that when you're done with it, you'll be able to answer the two questions of, do you see the picture in black and white, and how do I see a picture in black and white? That that becomes an echo, that a, a black and white picture, for me, always makes itself known. At the moment I, I hit the shutter, I know that that's a black and white. And it's really hard to explain that, but I think there's a way in which to teach that through exercise. And how do you know how to harvest an image, to extend the dynamic range of an image? Um, Welcome to Oz looks in two of the chapters on how to do that. And then how do you determine bokeh and how do you control the way the eye sees and light in the computer? Um, 2.0 in chapters one and two looks at that and gets into the discussion of um, shibumi, which is, um, the practice of elegant and perfect thought without thinking about it. It's a, it's a word in Japanese that has absolutely no definition other than it is to do the right thing at the right time elegantly and simply, but without thinking about it consciously, you simply do it. Now, wouldn't that be the goal when you're taking a picture to pick up the camera and then it all happens because it feels right, because it is right, and you don't have to sit there and noodle about it? Um, that's what I, I'm trying to do in those two books, and that's what Welcome to Oz 2.0 starts out. It's the first of three, possibly four books, and I'm working on the second book now in that series. Do you know if they're available in the UK? I have one of our attendees. Oh, they're available in the UK. Um, I would recommend ordering it through Amazon, um, 
Amazon is the cheapest of the places to order it, but I do yes, it, it's available in the UK. Um, it's expensive in the UK, but what I'd suggest doing is to order it from Amazon US, which would be cheaper um, than to order it in the UK. But yes, it is available in the UK. There's a Kindle version I see here. There is a Kindle version. It, um, this is an interesting thing about Kindle versions of books, right? You do realize it costs the same amount of money to produce the Kindle version of the book as it does to produce the paper book. The only difference is the seven bucks worth of paper that's involved. And the expectation that the Kindle book should be two dollars and the paper book is fifty. And that's a, um, I don't know where that battle is going to go. It's like producing um, content for the iPad. It costs the same amount of money to shoot it, edit it, and produce it as it does to produce a DVD. But you have to, there's an expectation that this should be should be less. There was a question that came in as to whether it's in the iBook store, speaking of Apple. I, don't. Um, I really want it to be in the iBook store because I'm a big fan of the iPad. Um, what's really cracked me up an observation about reading on an iPad or a Kindle or those devices. I'm a hardback book reader and I read about five books a week. I, I mean I just I'm a readaholic and I thought I would never ever 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 read an electronic book. How, how dare you insult my eyeballs, right? So I downloaded a book on my iPad, and I haven't bought a hardback book since. And um, this, I'm on the iPad 2, and I bought an iPad 1, and I just I can't believe that the only complaint I have is I can't read while the plane is taking off. You know, um, and I'm just surprised at myself at how easy it is actually to read on those devices, be it Kindle, be it iPad, and the iPad is a fairly easy way to read. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I agree with you. I'm a huge uh, ebook junkie. Just uh, also just a, a going from a more green perspective and not having to deal with carrying books everywhere. Um, now, there were a few questions in terms of whether we'll discuss more about focus and focal point. And what I'd like to do, Rebecca specifically, uh, and Stu is uh, I'd like to ask, I'll, I want to work with Vincent to get another webinar going where we'll focus on that more. This was uh, more, definitely more on the printing side, which I certainly appreciate. Printing is one of the, um, I, I, pr printing genuine fractals, perfect resize is somewhat of a red-headed stepchild with our webinar program because it's hard to, 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 to illustrate printing. Um, but Vincent did it really, uh, you know, uh, empirically and, and, and made a lot of sense. So I do want to focus on that and I'll work with Vincent. We will have a, another webinar and uh, it'll focus more on that because uh, let me tell you something, the, the conversations we had, I know I'm just kind of giving you a teaser here, but they were um, some of the most inspirational conversations I had and I'm not just saying that because Vincent's sitting three feet in front of me. And handing you $20 bills. And, uh, I'll keep them coming. <laughs> keep them coming. Right. Um, no, but uh, for I definitely think it's it's a worthy topic to bring up uh, on a dedicated webinar. And originally, I think we wanted to combine the two, but it makes sense to s separate them. So look out for that um, later on 